Welcome to At Issue. I'm your host, Steve Stavro. This week, we're going to be discussing the Vatican's role in the New World Order. Joining us is Bill Hughes, and thank you for being with us, Bill. Bill's an author, researcher, and pastor of the church here in Umatilla, Florida. I hope I said that right. Umatilla, Florida. You got it, Steve. Okay. And if you would, Bill, just let's just launch into this discussion with what do you think the Vatican's role is in the New World Order? Steve, I think ultimately they control every aspect of the New World Order from the political leaders, mm. uh, the financial gurus of our world today, uh, and also the churches of today. I think that's the clear picture that we have. And uh, all the research that I have done, Steve, pinpoints the domination of the Vatican in the world affairs of today. It's very secretive, Steve, in, in their involvement in all of these things because they look like they're uh, so good and, and mm -hmm. trying to promote peace and trying to promote harmony throughout the world. But in actuality, they're the ones that are pulling the strings behind the scenes. Uh, and again, in the political, religious, and economic uh, realms of this world. Okay. And for those who are not familiar with the workings of the Vatican, maybe we should just touch on who controls the Vatican when we say that word, what, that, what the Vatican means, um, the, the papacy of course, but maybe who is controlling the papacy and who, who do you see as wielding the power behind the throne, as to, to say it in a certain way? Well, in a, in a um, spiritual context, the Vatican means the divining serpent hmm. and um, the serpent throughout history, whether it be biblical history, whether it be secular history, uh, as far back as the Garden of Eden, the serpent, of course, was the uh, medium through which the devil sought to destroy our first parents, Adam and Eve. So ultimately, um, the devil is behind the Vatican. Now, when you look at, in a, in a, in a um, human point of view, uh, it's clear from history that the Jesuit order, which is the military arm of the Catholic Church, that they control the white pope, the one who we all see out in front. Uh, at this point, of course, it's Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, But uh, ultimately, the one behind the white pope is the black pope, the Jesuit general. And when you say the military arm of the Vatican, I think it's important that we say, you're not speaking hyperbole, you're speaking literally. They have a history of being assassins. If we could touch on just a few things in their history, maybe that's the way to approach this. Let's go back to 1517, Martin Luther's come on the scene, and the whole Protestant Reformation has begun. When you look at history, Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the door at Wittenberg in 1517. And uh, from there, uh, of course, he stood before the Diet of Worms and Charles V in 1521. Uh, the Reformation spread like wildfire because people for centuries had listened to tradition and had listened to lies and myths and, and foolishness. And so when Luther came in with his two great themes, one of sola fide, by faith alone, and the other sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible only, Steve, these, these sent a shock wave throughout Europe. And the Vatican that had stood so strong and so powerful for so long, they were shaken at their very foundations. 
And so you come up to the, the diets that were held. Of course, the Diet of Worms in 1521, the Diet of Spires in 1526, the Diet of Augsburg in 1530. Charles V sought every possible means to destroy the Reformation of Martin Luther. And it, but he couldn't stop it. And so in the 1530s, you have the rise of a, of a man by the name of Ignatius Loyola. And Loyola's intent was to destroy the Protestant Reformation of Luther and other reformers who started to rise throughout Europe. Well, by 1540, the Jesuit order was established. It was established for two basic reasons, very simply. It was established, number one, to destroy everything that the Protestant Reformation stood for. And the other thing is that as it would destroy the Protestant Reformation, it would reestablish the authority and power of the Roman Catholic Church. In that light, it's so critical that we understand everything that the Protestant Reformation stood for. Most people who still understand the Protestant Reformation think it was simply a religious movement. Well, of course, it was a powerful religious movement, but it infiltrated, it, it filtered into every aspect of human life. It had uh, power and authority in government because prior to the Reformation, there had been no such thing as Republican government. It had all been uh, monarchical, where you have a person dominating the populace. But the Protestant Reformation brought in the idea and the principle that there could be Republican representative government. Um, in the economic realm, through the Dark Ages, when the papacy ruled, you had the wealthy class, you had the very, very rich, you had the very, very poor. Well, the Protestant Reformation brought in the concept of a middle class, that people could earn a living and based on their talents and their skills and their hard work, they could make their own money. So. The Protestant Reformation brought in representative government, it brought in a middle class, and then of course in the religious arena it brought in the fact that people could worship God not as their pope or their priest told them to do, right. but they could go to God through Jesus Christ and not have to go through any man. So, no middleman. No middleman, Steve, that's exactly right. right. So these concepts, they came and these are the fruits of the Protestant Reformation. And wherever you see those things, it's because of Protestantism. And wherever you see them under attack, you know that you see the footprints of the Jesuits. And just real quickly, Steve, without getting too far off, when you see what happened in the, in the 1990s with Jesuit-trained President Bill Clinton, who went to Georgetown University, when he passed the North American Free Trade Agreement called NAFTA, which sent just thousands and thousands of middle-class jobs out of the United States of America and sent them to third world countries, Steve, you can see the footprints of the Jesuits all over that document to destroy the middle class in the United States of America. So that two classes could be developed in this country. A, a, an attempt to get us back to the Dark Ages, back to where you have, the, as you're saying, the wealthy, the poor, but on top of both groups, you have the papacy. Absolutely, Steve. The papacy being uh, the, the man who is God. And, and this, these are s several papal statements. These are bulls that are, that are, I'm not sure if they're bulls, but there are statements being made throughout history that the Pope is Jesus Christ on this planet. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There's a host of Catholic documents 
where the Pope takes the name of God, Lord God. He claims to be the Vicar of Christ. On his tiara throughout history, it has always read vicarious filii dei, which means I am the agent of God. I am God on this earth. So um, that's where all of this is heading, Steve. All of this new world order, it's, we're heading rapidly as we see the destruction of the middle class, as we see the destruction of Republican government, where we see more and more power being taken by the federal government. We see that in America as you and I are speaking. Just in the very last uh, several weeks, we have the passage of that health care bill, which, which takes tremendous power and puts it into the hands of a few people in Washington, D.C., which completely decimates Republicanism where the power rests with the people. So we see these, these great strides being made, not just in America, but around the world, to have power put in the hands of a few and the destruction of the middle class. So we see the power of the Jesuit order working to reestablish papal authority and supremacy in this earth. And so, Bill, do you see this as a fulfillment of what the Holy Alliance was trying to achieve back in the 1800s, the early 1800s? There's no question, Steve, because the Holy Alliance was established at the Congress of Vienna right around 1814, 1815 under the Austrian ruler named Clemens von Metternich. Von Metternich, along with the Pope at that time, I believe it was Pius VII, and a host of European powers got together in Vienna. They then subsequently met eight years later at Verona, and then there was a secret meeting in Cherie in 1825 and Steve, the whole goal of those three congresses, of those three meetings, were to destroy representative government throughout the world. And so we find in our world today, in fulfillment of those three congresses, the taking out of the people's hands authority in their countries and it being settled in the, the hands of just a few people. And again, we saw that with the health care bill just recently in America. Mm -hmm. That health care bill takes tremendous power out of the hands of people and puts it at Washington, D.C. So this is in fulfillment of those three Congresses. And, you know, another aspect of it, Steve, that's so critical for our understanding of what is happening in America today in light of those congresses is, is that in 1814 and 1815, according to Burke McCarty's book, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Lincoln, uh, another book that I have here, written by a man by the name of Richard Thompson, who was an American Secretary of the Navy, he wrote the book called The Footprints of the Jesuits. And he nails down that at the Congress of Vienna, in 1814, 1815, the Jesuit order was determined to be that group of men that would seek to destroy representative government in the world. And the primary focus, the bullseye, if you will, of the Congress of Vienna was a rising power across the shores of the Atlantic called the United States of America. So the Jesuit order would be sent here to the United States disguised as painters, as lawyers, as artisans, as printers, and it would be their determined purpose to destroy representative government in the United States. It was such a, such a dire threat to the United States that James Monroe in 1823 came out with his famous Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine was simply a statement to the, the powers that were in the Holy Alliance 
don't come and colonize in the Western Hemisphere. If you do, America will view that as an act of war and we will go to war with you. Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to James Monroe in which he said that this is the greatest threat to America since the revolution. So the, the men that lived during that time understood how critical these Congresses were and what a threat they were to the United States of America. The fact that we as Americans have become, have been so asleep and in such a stupor and allowed this to happen because we're seeing the fruits of those meetings today through the health care bill, through executive orders that are being passed that take authority out of the hands of the people and put it in the hands of just a, a very small few in Washington, D.C. John Adams wrote this to Thomas Jefferson. He said this about the Jesuit order. He said, shall we not have regular swarms of them here in as many disguises as only a king of the gypsies can assume, dressed as painters, publishers, writers, and schoolmasters? If ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell, it is this society of Loyola's. Steve, mm -hmm. the, the founding fathers, for all of their limitations, they were men, they made mistakes, but they understood history. They understood that from the time of the inception of the Jesuit order in 1540, till the time of their suppression by Pope Clement XIV in 1773, that the Jesuit order had used intrigue, insurrection, and assassination to take over nations. Steve, the founding fathers of the United States understood that. That was why Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe and John Adams were so deeply concerned Number one, about the reestablishment of the Jesuit order in 1814, but even more so, the Congress at Vienna, Verona, and Cherie, because these leaders in the United States understood that the Jesuit order had been earmarked to be that group of men that would destroy Republican government in the United States and to seek to reestablish papal domination in our country. They understood that, Steve. That's why the Monroe Doctrine was written. That's why John Adams made the statement he did. And that, Steve, is why Samuel B. Morse, the famous inventor of the Morse Code, wrote his two famous books, one published in 1835 called Imminent Danger, to the free institutions of the United States through foreign immigration and his other classic book that he had published in 1844 called Foreign Conspiracy Against the Liberties of the United States. These men, Steve, understood that the Jesuit order would do whatever it took, based on history, they would do whatever it took to destroy representative government in the United States, to destroy the middle class in the United States, and to destroy and take over all of the churches in the United States. And we are living today in that time, and we're seeing the fruits of those Congresses and the effective workings of the Jesuit order in this country. So what do you think about, let's contrast for a moment, the scene in the 1800s where presidents like Monroe and Jefferson and Adams are against the Holy Alliance, namely the Pope and the kings of Europe, uh, trying to infiltrate and, and control this country, destroy representative government. And today, when you've got presidents like George Bush, former President George Bush and Obama and these others racing to meet the Pope every time they can and, and actually bowing down to him on occasion, we've got pictures of that. What we have in the United States today is 
we have the uh, for for the most simple we we have the right fig in in the crystallizing of Jesuit takeover in this country. Mm -hmm. They have they take over, they produce their political leaders. George Bush was trained at Yale. He was a part of Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones is clearly connected to the man who started it in America, William Huntington Russell, had gone to Europe, had been in some Illuminati meetings in Germany, came over to America to start a chapter of Skull and Bones in America based on the Illuminati meetings he attended in Europe. And it's very, very clear that the man who created the Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, was simply a Jesuit foot soldier. When he started the Illuminati in 1776, he was teaching at Ingolstadt University, a Jesuit university in a stronghold of Jesuitism in Germany called Bavaria. And the principles of the Illuminati are the principles of the Jesuit order. So you have the Jesuit order, you have the Illuminati, then you have skull and bones. And so the Jesuit order through Skull and Bones has crystallized their plan to train political leaders in this nation. George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., both members of Skull and Bones take the Jesuit agenda into the White House. And what is the result of that? What did you have? You have 9-11. And George Bush coming out after 9-11 with the New Patriot Act, which was actually pinned by a Vietnamese refugee who has now come to America, who pins, he was trained at Georgetown, which is the preeminent Jesuit university in America, pins the New Patriot Act, which literally decimates, decimates our freedoms. So that now people will call me on the phone, Steve, and they'll say, did you write those books about those J's? And I'll, and I'll say, J's? I didn't write any books about birds. I wrote books about the Jesuits. Is that what you mean? Steve, people are afraid. Right. Because our liberties, our privacy, it, it's been taken over. It's been gutted. It's been gutted. That's, that's right. And so here is a man, George Bush, Jesuit trained, vows that he will obey the Pope and the, the uh, black Pope when he takes his initiation rites with the skull and bones at Yale, passing the new Patriot Act, which destroys your freedom and my freedom, in the prior to September 11th, George Bush dedicates a cultural center to John Paul in Washington, D.C., on the very soil where Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by Jesuits uh, in 1865. But here, at the end of the 20th century and into the 21st, now we have American presidents. George Bush at the dedication of the Cultural Center, he says, the greatest thing we can do to show our respect for John Paul is to bring his teachings into action here in the United States. So, Steve, we see this complete change from men back in the 19th century who understood the evils of Rome to whereas today you have George Bush with skull and bones giving his life to the Jesuit order. You have Bill Clinton who was trained at Georgetown University. You have Barack Obama who it's very, very clear has one Jesuit trained member on his staff after another. The only one that comes to mind right off is Leon Panetta, who is the head of the CIA, who was trained at Santa Clara University, which is a Jesuit university on the West Coast. So Barack Obama is surrounded 
by Jesuit trained men. And his vice president is a Roman Catholic. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. A devout Roman Catholic. The head of the house is Nancy Pelosi, Roman Catholic. Absolutely. In fact, when Nancy Pelosi was uh, brought in as the Speaker of the House, she brought onto the floor of the Congress her Jesuit mentor, Stephen Privet, to mm. address the Congress of the United States. The first time in American history that a Jesuit priest had addressed the Congress of the United States. Mm. So the group vowed to destroy us are brought in, which may be indicating that they don't need to destroy us now, they've taken us over. Absolutely. And Steve, the, the thing that's so very diabolical about this is that the Jesuit order controls both sides of the House of Representatives. I remember in the recent health care bill, as they were considering the passage of that bill, you have Nancy Pelosi Jesuit trained, has a Jesuit mentor, mm -hmm. and she's pushing for the passage of the health care bill. The man who was opposing it, which was the House Minority Leader, his name is John Bonner. John Bonner was trained at the Jesuit University. He's Jesuit trained. So they control both sides of the spectrum. Right. And we see that happening. This, this is the crystallization of, of Jesuit power and intrigue in the United States. It's controlling both political parties, whether it be Democrat or Republican, controlling both sides of an issue so that they can gain their synthesis. And that's what's happening today. And it all, Steve, is the fruits of and the byproduct of the Congress of Vienna, Verona, and Cherie. And instead of our political leaders today warring against it, as Jefferson and Monroe and Adams did, now we have American politicians who are slaves to the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order. And I guess a lot of people are wondering why others in the Protestant uh, arena aren't speaking out. The Billy Grahams, the uh, Robert Schulers, why are they not speaking out in your opinion? Steve, it's very, very clear from a statement that a trained Jesuit priest who escaped from the Jesuit order made his way here to the United States while he was under oath as a Jesuit in his training, he was told something. The man's name was Alberto Rivera. In a, in a little magazine, it's called The Godfathers, put out by Chick Publications. Alberto Rivera made a startling statement in which he said there would be a sign given to Jesuits throughout the world when all churches would be taken over by the Jesuit order. This was, and I'll read the statement to you. Okay. It says this, Alberto Rivera, the sign was to be when a president of the United States took his oath of office facing an obelisk. For the first time in U.S. history, the swearing-in ceremonies were moved to the west front of the Capitol and President Reagan faced the Washington Monument. This happened January 20th, 1981. Steve, the Jesuit order was raised up to destroy everything that Protestantism had done, to destroy representative government, to destroy the middle class, but also, Steve, to destroy the voice of protest throughout Protestant churches. We're not protesting anymore, Steve. Right, there's, there's silence. Billy Graham is not, he didn't protest or, towards the latter part of his life. For the first part, I think he was solid when he first started. But along around the early 60s, his voice was silenced. 
Robert Schuller, uh, Paul Crouch, um, Hal Lindsey, um, Pat Robertson, James Dobson, all of these men, they're not protesting. What they have become is are agents, agents of Rome. And what we have developing in our country right now, Rome again controlling both sides of the pendulum. As a, as a German philosopher by the name of George Friedrich Hegel, when he identified the best way to, to create change and to get what you want to happen, it's called the Hegelian dialectic. And what you do is you control both sides of a situation, whether it be political parties or ideologies, but you control both sides so that you can create your synthesis. And today in the United States, the Jesuit order controls the very, very liberal, radical element that we find in the White House today, in Barack Obama, um, and the control that he is gaining daily in this country. But we also have the Tea Party movement, the religious right, the conservative element uh, run by Dobson and Robertson and and some of your talk show hosts like Glenn Beck, uh, Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly. The Jesuits control both sides of this, Steve, and it's their desire to create such chaos, and that's what we see in America today, such chaos, the radical and the ultra-conservative, and there will be a clash. And in the aftermath of that clash, Steve, they will get their synthesis. But that's where we're heading today, rapidly, in this country. I don't think many people know that Fox News, uh, the, the owner of Fox News is Rupert Murdoch. He's a Knight of Malta. And maybe if we could talk about for a moment, what, what are Knights of Malta? What, what are, who are those people? Well, Steve, there are so many different organizations that are called the Knights of something. Uh, whether it be the Knights of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of the Golden Circle, which John Wilkes Booth was a part of, uh, and who claims that they were the ones responsible for the assassination of Lincoln. Steve, I have found in, in researching all of these different groups of Knights, if you take it back to their ultimate source, uh, they were created by Catholic or Jesuit priests. And all of these groups, Steve, have specific functions that they carry out on behalf of the white and the black pope. And Rupert Murdoch as a Knight of Malta, William Casey, who was a Knight of Malta, who headed the CIA during the presidencies of, of Ronald Reagan and I believe of George Bush. Um, wherever you see these men, Teddy Kennedy was not a Knight of Malta, but he was a Knight of Columbus. Uh, all of these men, Steve, are working on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church. Glenn Beck, Sean Hannity, Bill O'Reilly, Rupert Murdoch, they're pushing this agenda over here to combat the agenda of Barack Obama. What Americans do not understand, Steve, because it's hidden, is that Rome is behind it all with their synthesis waiting in the wings. And maybe we should touch on the fact that the Catholic laity are not we're not, we're not speaking against them, per se. Uh, I have relatives who are Roman Catholic, and they have no idea who the Jesuits are or what they're capable of. If they do know of the Jesuits, they're not uh, uh, in the knowledge about what they do and what they are capable of doing. Steve, this, this has nothing whatsoever to do with individual Roman Catholics. There are, there are many many devout Roman Catholics throughout the world. Um, 
many of my, a lot of my family on my wife's side are, are they consider themselves Orthodox Christians. But in the final analysis, they're Roman Catholics. And there's so many fine Roman Catholic people, this has nothing to do with them. Um, this is simply about a hierarchical structure that for centuries has been hell-bent on world domination and doing anything and everything necessary to bring about that world domination. If it means the destruction of, of, of leaders, if it means creating depressions, if it means destroying people's economies, it makes no difference. Um, it's simply about control and domination. And we're talking about the hierarchical structure of the Catholic Church that a lot of people today believe has changed, that it's now presenting a Christian guise because the priests wear crosses about their necks. Mm. But the Catholic Church themselves have declared, we do not change. And um, given the right atmosphere, the Catholic Church will come forward um, and will seek to give what they feel will save this planet, Steve and it will be the ultimate demise of this world. And I think we ought to touch on the Council of Trent and what came out of that council back in the, uh, get the dates right, uh, well, middle 1500s. I would, it was a span of 13 years the Council of Trent was conducted or so. Uh, what came out of that and has that been renounced at this point in time or? It's very fascinating. See, the Council of Trent was from 1546 to 1563. And during that council, there was discussion among Jesuits who had just been formed, the Jesuit order having been formed 1540. And the, the Jesuit order was taking the lead. There were many Catholic priests, however, in the beginning at the Council of Trent who were strongly influenced by the Protestant Reformation. And so they were discussing what would the Catholic Church do in response to the Reformation. Steve, the ultimate uh, decision of the Council of Trent where the Jesuits took the day and controlled it ultimately was that anybody who embraced the teachings of the Protestant Reformation would be considered anathema and would be considered heretics and would be open season to be destroyed. And that's the ultimate goal and the ultimate decision of the Council of Trent. Um, tragically, Steve, tragically, in light of Alberto Rivera's statement that the Jesuit order has infiltrated and taken over all Protestant churches, the Protestant churches today are no longer protesting. Protestant churches today are no longer embracing the two great concepts of Martin Luther, sola scriptura and sola fide. It's not there anymore, Steve. And uh, tragically, tragically, we don't have Protestant churches anymore. We have evangelical churches but they're no longer protesting. Um, thank God there are people standing up that are protesting, but they're few and far between. Because I think with us, we would go for our authority on, on any issue. We would point at the Bible. We'd say, what, where does, what does Scripture say as the Word of God? What, what does it say? Roman Catholics would not necessarily do that. They would listen to what the Pope has said. Oh, absolutely. You know, there was a, an article that was in the USA Today newspaper, and this was back maybe a year ago. Mm -hmm. Benedict came out and he, he declared, and it was in USA Today, and it was in an encyclical that he had put out, where he said there is salvation only. Now, he didn't say it was in Jesus Christ, Steve. He said there is salvation that can only be found in one church and that's in the Church of Rome. 
Now that was published in an encyclical within the last year or two. So how it is that, that evangelical churches can, can allow that, can accept that, that's unconscionable. That, that completely rewrites history and brings us back prior to the 95 theses that were nailed right. on the doors at Wittenberg Chapel. Jesus would say, I am the way, I am the truth. Absolutely, Steve. And the Pope says, he's in essence saying, he is the way. Absolutely. Um, Benedict is saying that he is the way, the Catholic Church is the only way to salvation. And um, a Protestant could never accept that. A true Protestant could never accept that. Tragically, the churches, all churches, uh, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, the Presbyterians or the Universal or the, the Lutheran or the Baptist or the Seventh-day Adventist. We're talking, Steve, about all churches. Alberto Rivera's statement, it applies carte blanche across the board. Every church has been infiltrated and taken over. And I, I would challenge, Steve, I would challenge any person watching this broadcast to go back and analyze their church in the last 30 years since Ronald Reagan took his oath facing the Washington Monument, if they have not seen their church and what their church once believed to have been completely rewritten. Right. I would challenge anyone, Steve. Another thing I would challenge people to do is to go back and analyze over the last 30 years if their church has not completely watered down their view on who the Antichrist is. Prior to that, Steve, prior to 1980, back in, say, the 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, there was not a Protestant church in America or in the world that did not understand who the Antichrist power was of Scripture, who Babylon the Great is in Revelation 17. All churches knew that. They knew it was the system of Roman Catholicism. Right. Martin Luther said the papacy is Antichrist. Absolutely. You know, when you look at the documents of all the reformers from Luther to, to uh, John Knox in Scotland, to Zwingli in Switzerland, to Tyndale in England, to Towson in Sweden, all the reformers had one thing in common. They all believed that the papacy was the Antichrist. That they agreed on. Now, there were a lot of things they didn't agree on, but that one they did. Why it is today that we don't hear that? Well, it's obvious because what Alberto Rivera said is true. And the reports I've read are, are that he was poisoned, oh, Rivera. I, I spoke with Alberto Rivera about probably a year before he died. And I asked him, I said, Dr. Rivera, you're not well, why? Would you tell me what happened? And he told me that he went to a dentist who claimed to be a Protestant. And the dentist, he was gonna fix some of his teeth. A dentist took and, and took a needle to numb his mouth and shot it just as far into his mouth as he could. And it was poison. Mm. And Alberto Rivera said from that day, he said, I have had horrible headaches uh, that, that leave me just listless. And um, sometime within a year after that, he was dead. And the Jesuits have a history of assassinating or murdering people who are outspoken, who get in their way. Steve, that, that has been going on from the get-go. I mean, um, numerous attempts on Queen Elizabeth I. Oh, it, it's... Besides Luther, numerous attempts on, on Queen Elizabeth. We, we established, Steve, it's a fact of history. The Jesuits were started in 1540. From that point, you have in 
Queen Elizabeth came into power in 1558, ruled for the next 45 years in England till 1603. During that time period, because she refused, this was her only crime, she refused the supremacy of the Pope in her kingdom. She refused to allow the Pope to control her throne. There were at least a dozen plots on her life. If, if it had not been for the intervention of God and the work of her immediate assistants, a man by the name of Francis Walsingham and Lord Cecil, these two men matched wits with the assassins who tried to kill Elizabeth. And these two men protected her with the power of God, of course. Because all of those attempts failed, Steve, Philip II of Spain, who was a devout Catholic, he was the son of Charles V who tried Luther at Worms. Both Charles V and his son Philip II both used all of their wealth, all of their political power to destroy the Protestant Reformation. Well, when Elizabeth could not be killed, Philip II and the Pope at that time, they got together and Spain built the most powerful fleet of ships that had ever been assembled. It was called the Spanish Armada. The purpose for the Spanish Armada was one. It was to go up the western side of Europe and to go right up into England and destroy the throne of Protestant Queen Elizabeth. That was the whole reason for it. The movie that, that came out within the last few years, I think it's called Elizabeth the Golden Age, d discusses this and, and, and probably one of the things that she says and the actress says in the movie is that a gentleman in the bowels of the ships is the Inquisition. Okay and be ready. If they land, we will have to face that. Oh, that's a true statement, Steve. That's indeed a true statement. Elizabeth was only one, Steve. Uh, right in that same time frame of Elizabeth from 1558 to 1603, you have William of Orange in the Netherlands. William of Orange had been in the court of Charles V he detested what Charles V was doing in, in his power as the Holy Roman Emperor and his determination just to destroy and, and to squash all of, of, his, of his subjects. William of Orange, he became the leader of the Netherlands and sought to bring religious freedom to the people of the Netherlands. He was killed in 1584. In 1598, Henry IV of France passed the Edict of Nantes, which gave religious freedom to all the French Huguenots. Well, for the next 12 years, there were several assassination attempts made on his life. Finally, in 1610, Henry IV was killed by a Jesuit assassin. The man's name was Revelic. In 1603, when King James, who is the man whose name is attributed to the King James Bible, when he came into power in England with the demise and death of Queen Elizabeth, two years into his reign in 1605, as he was going to meet with Parliament in England in November of 1605, the Jesuit priests of, of England, the, the main one was Francis Garnet. Garnet plotted with a host of people to blow up the English Parliament and James I all on the same day, November 5th, 1605. They got these huge kegs of gunpowder. And one man by the name of Guy Fawkes 
was right underneath the parliament building there. All these kegs of gunpowder. Steve, he was going to ignite them and blow parliament and King James into eternity. Well, fortunately, it was found out that he was there with all that gunpowder. Well, Guy Fawkes was arrested. For many, many decades after that, November 5th was celebrated in England as Guy Fawkes Day. Now, I believe it's still celebrated as that, but for the first many decades after that, every year, November 5th, people throughout England would have bonfires and they would burn one man in effigy. Guess who it was who they would burn in effigy? I think it was the Pope. It was the Pope. That's exactly okay, right. I, that's what I thought. Okay, that's right. Good. But you know what? Over the course of time, and because of Jesuit influence in England, they don't burn the Pope November 5th anymore. It's probably a hate crime now, and they'll probably <laughs> arrest you if you do it now in this country. Oh, it would be, I Steve. Mean, it would that's be. where we've come to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, Steve, there, there were one assassination attempt after another. Queen Elizabeth, William of, of the Netherlands, uh, Henry IV of France, um, King James I of England in 1605. So right there, within that little span of about 50 years, you've got five, five world leaders of nations with assassination attempts on their lives. Why? Because they were not going along with the Jesuit agenda. And Steve, we have seen that here in the United States of America as well. Uh, we have seen presidents, uh, of course, the most well-known would be Abraham Lincoln in 1865, John F. Kennedy in 1963. He was killed because he was not following Rome's agenda for America. William Henry Harrison in 1840. Andrew Jackson was in 1835. Um, there was an attempt on Jackson's life. Absolutely, on Andrew Jackson. He stopped the bank. He killed the bank. Right. Uh, and I want to say the bank, the central, the, the push for a national central bank. Absolutely, Steve. And the guy who tried to kill him, Richard Lawrence, he tried to do that in 1835. Um, Zachary Taylor in 1850. Taylor wanted to preserve the Union, wanted to pres preserve the United States. The Jesuits were trying to split it in half by, you know, in the 1840s into the 1850s. They finally got their way in 1860. And that's a good point. It, the, the entire war between the states, the war of federal aggression, whatever you wanted to call it, was a, a Jesuit concoction to divide America and, and bring down this constitutional republic. There's no question, Steve. And, and the, the documents the, the, uh, that are out there, it's just overwhelming. One man um, after the assassination of Lincoln who was on the military commission that tried the assassins of Lincoln uh, it was a conspiracy, Steve, to not only kill Lincoln, but to kill Andrew Johnson, the vice president, to kill William Seward, the secretary of state, and also to kill Ulysses S. Grant, who was the head of the Union forces. Well, the military commission that tried the assassins of Lincoln, they found out that almost all of them were associated with the Roman Catholic Church. The Surratts, um, George Atsterot, Davy Harold, uh, George McLaughlin, uh, or excuse me, Michael O'Laughlin, Louis Payne. And Booth had started attending Mass. Absolutely. And there, in fact, there was a, a Catholic cross that was found on Booth's person uh, when he died. You had mentioned John Kennedy most people are told Lee Harvey Oswald is the lone gunman. What do you think of all that? Steve, it's fascinating because um, 
there's a book that you can get in any library. It's called The Last Dissenting Witness. It's by Jean Hill. If you look in the Zabruder film, she was the lady on the, the grassy area, the little island there, and uh, she had the long red coat on. And Jean Hill writes in her book, and uh, she says it was so obvious that as she was standing there, she heard shots coming from many different directions. If you watch the Zabruder film, it's clear that Kennedy goes forward because something hit him, a bullet hit him from the back, but then he jerks back like this. Right. It's obvious, Steve, there were multiple bullets that were shot from multiple directions that assassinated Kennedy. And there were three reasons why they killed him. Because he wanted to reestablish the coining of money by Congress. Uh, he tried to pull us out of Vietnam, which was a Catholic war, and he tried to dismantle the CIA. In 1984, after 170 years of cutting the ties of U.S. Vatican diplomacy, Ronald Reagan sent an ambassador to the Vatican. The reason why an ambassador had been cut off from Rome in 1867 was because the military commission that tried those who killed Abraham Lincoln were found to be Roman Catholics. And so the U.S. in protest withdrew their ambassador from Rome. Well, 117 years later, 1984, Ronald Reagan sends an ambassador to Rome. If you remember when Ronald Reagan died, sometime within the last few years, there was a high requiem mass that was given for Ronald Reagan. A high requiem mass is only given for those who have done special service for the Roman Catholic Church. Ronald Reagan was honored in his death by Rome. And I think we've seen Clinton, uh, former President Clinton at mass, and also George Bush at mass. And I don't think you can be partaking of communion unless you are Roman Catholic. I, do you have any thoughts on that? Steve, I don't think you're allowed to take the communion in the Catholic Church unless you are a Roman Catholic. So we have some closet Catholics. No, no doubt about it, no doubt. The only, the only reason, Steve, that, that Clinton never came out, even though he went to Georgetown, which is the preeminent Jesuit university in Washington, D.C., and the only reason George Bush didn't come out when he when he made his vow and entered the Order of Skull and Bones at Yale, he had to bow before the leader of Skull and Bones at Yale. He had to bow before somebody who was dressed up like the White Pope, and he had to bow down before a man who was dressed up like the Jesuit general. George Bush sold himself when he was at Yale and the only reason he didn't come right out and say, I'm a Catholic, is because it, it would have upset people and it would have spilled the apple cart. This way he could do, he could do exactly what Rome wanted him to do and nobody would think twice. If Jesus Christ does not return and take us back to heaven, we are entering, Steve, another dark age. That's where this world is going. It's to another dark age. But I believe that uh, God's not going to allow that. Uh, the papacy had their chance, and they failed through the dark ages. This time, before it can uh, go too far, Christ will come. And those who have embraced him as their Savior and Lord, he will take them to heaven. Well, I want to thank you, Bill, for being with us today, letting us come into your church here in Umatilla, Florida. And let me just say that we'll be joining you again next week with another documentary or production. Until then, God bless.